I'm Katherine Ramsland, and welcome to Eureka Training. We start with a story. Gerald is running for a train. He knows that it leaves every hour at five minutes after the hour. And when he arrives at the station, he looks at the clock, and he realizes that the hour hand and the minute hand are both between the one and the two. He's relieved. Why? We'll come back to that. Anyone can have a eureka moment at any time. I've had a few just sitting around here <laughs> waiting to speak. But what I want to talk to you about is how you can harness this energy on a regular basis to advance your work. So this is, I, I put together uh, from all the different items that I learned about other people having eureka moments and also the neuroscience, as she mentioned, um, how, could, how could you actually make this work for you rather than waiting around for it to happen? So that's, that's essentially what I'm going to talk about. I take my cue from a 19th century mathematician, Henri, uh, Henri Poincaré, who had given a talk to a group of psychologists in 1908 in Paris. And he had learned about the, the rhythms of the mental life when he would come to an impasse in his work, and his work was pretty tough. He would go on a walk or take an excursion or talk to someone and found that often he'd have a breakthrough right then. It would come to him with such clarity and such certainty and completeness that it astounded him. But he realized that the unconscious and conscious mind really must work together. You have to have them both. Um, and he actually likened the mind to a purchaser that has an array of products on the shelves and he thought that the unconscious mind actually did a much better job of mixing and matching these items than the conscious mind did. So he thought when you, you have to do your work, but you also have to relax, step back, and let it play. So advance 100 years into neuroscience territory and what we have done with brain research and brain scans trying to figure out what goes on in the brain when we do certain activities. And a few different groups of scientists have, have tried to, they've, they wanted to figure out, well, what happens during a moment of sudden insight, a eureka moment, a breakthrough, a flash of genius? What happens in the brain? And how do we get that in the laboratory? How do we spark that? So I'm going to show you three different ways that some people have tried to do that. The first one is to give people a nonsense sentence. They don't really quite know what it means. But as they're reading it, you flash a context. So that's a shift, a perceptual shift, a slight alteration in, ah, so, oh, that's what that means. So here's a few other examples. And then you can, they're hooked up, the subjects are hooked up to EEGs or fMRIs to, and they can measure what's going on when the context is flashed at them. A little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more difficult is the story problem. And typically, this is done under the pressure of time. In th this particular one, you get 90 seconds to do. You enter a two-story house. On the ground floor is a set of three light switches. Two don't work, but one illuminates a light bulb in the second floor, which you can't see from downstairs. You enter. This light is off. Your task is to figure out which of those three switches turns it on. And you can flip them as much as you want, but you can only go upstairs once. Now, within 90 seconds, you have to figure this out. Everybody's wired up. You can calculate this, or you can arrive at a sudden insight. And that's the point. They want to make a comparison. I suppose you want the answer to this, right? <laughs> Here's the answer. Put on switch A for several minutes, turn it off, put on switch B, run upstairs. If the light is on, switch B, turn it on. If it's not on, feel it. If it's warm, switch A, turn it on. If it's not warm and it's not on, switch C will do the trick. So that's how, so you could calculate that, or it could just flash at you. The third type of problem is more of a word completion, where you are asked to come up with a single word that will make a familiar compound with these three. And again, you could calculate this, or it could just flash at you. It doesn't matter which one. They're trying to make comparisons from those who do the calculations. So you could say, crab meat, pine meat, mm, not really. Crab legs, pine legs, mm, that doesn't get us anywhere. Or how about apple? Crab apple, pineapple, applesauce. 
So they use a series of these types of puzzles to try to get a, a sense of aha, a flash of enlightenment, a sudden insight. And what they found is that those who use sudden insight actually have a difference in their brains. There are two main things that go on. One is that in the, in the back of the brain, in the occipital lobe, there's a weakening of activity, as if the brain is pulling in and cutting off external stimulation in order to prepare itself to switch strategies. That, that moment of impasse is a signal to the brain of, this isn't going this is as far as we go here, switch strategies into the right brain, and there's a little spark that occurs right in the right temporal lobe, right over the right ear, just before the moment of insight. And so, the neuroscientists have actually supported what Poincaré said. He didn't have access to all the brain scans, but he was quite right about, about the brain shifting strategies at a certain point. So the impasse is a signal to move back. I came up with my own little program, and I, it has three steps, scan, sift, and solve. Easy to remember. And I'm going to tell you about each of these three steps, but first I want to to say that this is best done in the context of something you're working on. A problem, a project, a strategy, a mission, something. This, this works best in that regard. For example, I'm, I'm working on doing a presentation to attorneys about how to use storytelling effectively in the courtroom. So this project, for me, I, ha I have a goal, I have a focus, and I have a sense of momentum. And so hopefully this program will work for me. I've taken a lot of walks <laughs> while I've been working on it, and for this one as well. So my first step, scan. That's the hard work. That's the, the, the conscious mind, as Poincaré might say it. And this is where you stock the shelves. I take my cue from another 19th century genius, Dr. Joseph Bell, who was the mentor to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes series, and who actually grabbed Bell's method of observation <laughs> for his character. So uh, Bell is actually a prototype of Sherlock Holmes in real life. And he would teach his medical students how to mindfully engage in an educated way so that when their patients came to them, they could observe them in fine detail and uh, making observations much much more uh, in a sophisticated way than most of us generally do. But you have to educate yourself to do that so that you understand what you're seeing. And Bell, for example, made a study of all the tattoos, of all the scars, of d different ways that people dress. And even he understood, he knew all the different soil types in Scotland so that he could look at their shoes when they came in and figure out from where they came before ever asking them a question. So he really advocates learning deeply, learning, immersing fully in your subject matter. But I want to add a little bit more to that. Not only do I want to learn everything I can about my project, but I want to add some other things in. So you read widely, diversely, because I want to create what I call idea stew. This is where the unconscious part of this equation gets to, to make serendipitous connections among many things. So while I'm, I'm working on my project, I might also add in a TED Talk, for example, <laughs> any kind of documentary. Um, I might try to learn something about how my car works. I might uh, learn how to make wine. I might read someone's biography that has nothing to do with my subject matter, S study the history of baseball. Every single thing is a potential candidate for this mixing and matching that the brain does. Everything you experience, everything you observe, everything you learn, everything you hear, et cetera. And so that's what I say. You want to get that idea stew there so that you can then move on to the next step. But before we, we go to the SIF step, there's one more aspect of the scan step that I really love. And you can also harness this energy, but that's another talk. Getting into the state of flow, being so attuned to your project that you can work on it for hours, and time passes. You don't feel it. It feels like minutes. You don't know that you're hungry. You don't know that you're cold. You don't hear the signals that you're getting a text <laughs> or anything like that. You are so attuned to your project. And we do find that eureka moments are highly correlated with people who can do this. And another thing that we found that, that sudden insight comes to are people in a good mood. 
So I will leave it to you to find out how to make a good mood out of whatever project you're working on. I know how to do it for me. <laughs> In the sift stage, this is my second stage, is where we now want that wonderful association cortex in our brain, which has a, a, all these feedback loops to integrate information, to go to work and start sifting through all this stuff that we put on the shelves. But I want to actually revisit this notion of the purchaser. Now, before I get to that, let me just tell you, you have to find for yourself what will work. And so here are some of the ways to reduce focus, to shut down that, that clenched frontal lobe and left brain. You could go to a movie. Isaac Asimov, whenever he had writer's block, he would go to a movie. I once tried this before I even sat in the seat. I had to take out my tablet and write down all the, all the ideas that came. It's wonderful. But that worked for him all the time. Play with your dog. Sing. Take a nap. Lots of people swear by sleep. Juggle. You know, do, do whatever you need. Take a shower. Love, many people talk about eureka moments happening in the shower. Many people. In fact, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Um, talk with friends. That was Einstein. He loved to do that. I swear by this last one, taking a walk. I've trained my body to know this is my time for my brain to start shifting through everything I've been doing. And typically it works, but I will tell you this. While I've been working on this project for the attorneys, I, ha I came to a moment of impasse where I, I knew I needed a story. I knew I knew a lot of stories that would work, but I couldn't think of the right one. So I went for a walk thinking, oh, it'll come, and it didn't. There's no guarantee of this. It's just about probability. <laughs> it didn't come. Not to worry. I trust my brain. Go to for a walk the next day. It didn't come. Okay, whatever. That night, woke up in the middle of the night. There it was. I had it exactly what I needed. I didn't even have to get out of bed. I was so sure of it that I knew I'd remember it, and I did the next day. I plugged it right into the place, the hole that I had from my impasse, impasse broken. I still swear by walks, but now I like my sleep as well. <laughs> Now, let me go back to this idea of the purchaser because I actually think it's a little bit more sophisticated. I like the idea of data mining much better because it, this is an idea, of, it's a software program that actually looks for all kinds of hidden patterns and connections and pulls things together in ways that you would not, never normally think about. So I actually think of the mind as less a purchaser and more as a data miner. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, there was a NASA engineer, Jim Crocker, was working on the Hubble telescope. It, it needed repair, but there was, were parts that they just couldn't reach, and they had no tools to do it. He went to his hotel that night, and he was taking a shower, and he saw that the way the shower head was fixed had all these adjustable rods, and he went, that's what I need. He created a whole new tool based on that shower head, and he fixed the telescope. That was a great one. One of my favorite ones in the book that I wrote is uh, Martin Cooper uh, was at a, an engineer at Motorola. He hated the fact that we had every time the phone rang, he had to get up and go to it. He was watching an episode of Star Trek, and Captain Kirk pulls out that communicator that looks so much like a flip phone. <laughs> And it came to him, that's what I want. I want that kind of thing. It took a few years, but eventually we got that cool little Motorola flip phone, which I actually miss. I think it was a great phone. But that was the start of that idea. That was the germ. So uh, you work at it, then you step back and let the mind put these things together for this final wonderful step, solve. I might even call my program, I, I call it Scan, Sift, and Solve, but it actually could be Work, Play, Wow, because that's how it feels. This is it. And that's how Poincaré uh, described it, this certainty, completeness, just, just this wonderful sense. Others who have had this experience have said, I don't know how I couldn't have seen it. It was just so clear when it came to me. And it is really a, quite an exciting step. So it's a perceptual shift as the brain switches strategies to, to pop out that moment for you. It gives you a sense of, of purpose and momentum. And we've had actually quite a few innovations and inventions that have come from Eureka moments. And what you're going to see here is a short list, but these are quite amazing things. A lot of people, by the way, have also gotten rich from these things, <laughs> too.
<laughs> but here's a short list of the many things that have popped out by this very formula that I just told you. So what is the magical link between impasse and enlightenment? It is the prepared mind, getting yourself ready for it, that purchaser, that data miner, whatever it is. I thank Henri Poincaré and the neuroscientists who demonstrated with science how it all works for my little program, Scan, Sift, and Solve. Now let's go back to Gerald running for the train. I told you we'd get back to this. He looks at the clock and he sees the hour hand and the minute hand between the one and the two, and he's relieved because he's going to make his train. And we would normally say, what? That train left at five after. You're not going to make it. But there's another one and two in this clock, the 12. So if the hour hand, oh, did you feel the aha? Oh, I feel so good. The 12, if the hour hand and the minute hand are between the one and the two of the 12, he will make his train, and I hope that you will too. Thank you.